Father, Father, we thank you that you are here. We don't have to beg you to be in your presence. Lord, you're here. We give a little, you're there with arms wide open. We praise you, God. We praise you because we know that you're, you're going to speak to us today. And so, God, I just pray for each and every one of us, Lord, that you would give us tender hearts, hearts that are tender to your presence. God, hearts that are tender to your word, Lord, that we wouldn't hear your word and then just walk away and forget as if you hadn't spoken to us. God, give us ears to hear your word. Give us a mind to understand it. Give us a heart to receive it and give us a will that we would actually be obedient to your words and that we would actually change things in our lives that bring you glory. We pray that here at Neighborhood Church, it would be as it is in heaven. We pray that it would be in our hearts as it is in heaven. We pray that you would be honored today. We're here for you and we're ready to hear from your word. And the church says, amen. You may be seated. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. I have some um, coworkers that I work with that tell me to stop saying that um, because I like to say it a little too much. I'm going to keep on, Pastor Zach, I'm going to keep on. But it is a beautiful day at Neighborhood Church. This is the part where, if you're new, I get to remind you that I am not our lead pastor. Um, our lead pastors are getting a well-deserved rest and relaxation, some R&R. &R. And so I'm going to be giving the word today. My name is Pastor Amanda. I'm our kids pastor and discipleship pastor here, and I'm so excited. Um, actually, I could have just skipped it and let Hunter keep on with those announcements and uh, Hunter and Haley and then Hunter with the word for offering, uh, because today we're going to talk about giving. I know, you know, I know. Here's the thing. I'm going to protect my pastor real quick. We uh, love our pastors, Pastor Tori and Pastor Polly. It's an honor uh, to work under them. I would never want to work at another church. I genuinely mean that. Um, I'm grateful for them, grateful for their leadership, mentorship, and I know you guys are too. But I want to protect Pastor Tori real quick because most pastors don't like to talk about giving, okay? And most congregations don't want to hear about giving, so I want you to know what Pastor Tori did not do was say, here, Amanda, do this, and then he left town. <laughs> I promise you that's not what happened. Um, I don't know if it's because I'm still young enough in ministry that I would voluntarily choose uh, to speak on this, or it's the Spirit of God, whichever one. We'll see. You guys can tell me at the end, but I really feel like I kind of set myself up for a fail here because you know what I've never heard? I've been in the church all my life, and I have never heard that message on giving was the best message I've ever heard. That message, on it was so moving. The pastor was talking about tithe, and all of a sudden I was like experiencing the presence of God. I've never heard anything even remotely similar to that, uh, so I may have set myself up for an L, as the kids say. That means a loss. I think they still say that. I don't know. We'll have to ask the youth group. <clears throat> But the good news is, here at Neighborhood Church, we are Jesus followers, and we love the Lord, and we want to hear all of the Word of God, and we want to know what God wants for us. And so our pastor preaches that way. He doesn't shy away from hard topics, um, and so in his honor, I won't either. But the truth is that a lot of pastors don't want to talk about this issue, and a lot of congregations don't want to hear about this issue. Um, pastors, there's a lot of reasons, but one of them is, you know, you mention funds one time, and then all of a sudden people are like, that pastor, he wants my money. He's always coming for my money. He's as bad as those TV evangelists. Money, money, money. So nobody wants to be labeled the money guy. Um, but pastors like our pastor, who have such a heart of gold, and again, our pastor teaches the entire word of God, but 
many pastors who just love people don't want to make people uncomfortable, especially if it's your first Sunday here. You know, we don't want to get labeled the money church, the church that wants your money, the church that has things to say about money all the time. But I'll say this, avoiding the topic of finances, I would love to avoid the topic of finances in all areas of my life. However, you're not allowed to, okay? You're not allowed to, and so we won't avoid it here. Um, but avoiding it in the church, the American church, has led to a few problems. So you guys have heard of Barna. We talk about them often. Barna is an organization that they do uh, statistics, and they kind of keep their finger on the state of the American church. And one statistic from them is that 43% of Christians, 43%, that's almost half, 43% of Christians say they don't know what the word tithe means. 43. So if 43% of Christians say that they don't know what the word tithe means, there's probably somebody in this room. So I'll go ahead and tell you, a tithe is the practice of believers to take 10% of their income and give it to the church. So every time you would get a paycheck, if you were a tithe giver, you would take 10% of that tithe and you would give it to the church, whether that was on a weekly, bi-weekly kind of thing. So even the lingo of tithe has been lost in our culture a lot. Um, broader statistics, only 5% of the United States tithes. 5%. And for any normal congregation that you would look at, only about 10 to 25% of the congregation are committed tithers. And this is crazy. Out of givers overall in the church, 80% of them, 80%, so that's the bulk, they tithe 2% or less of their income. So not even a tithe, 2% or less. So if you're not a numbers person, I'll summarize for it. I'm not a numbers person either, by the way. Anybody who knows me knows I'm not. But all of this to say that it's a statistical fact that the American church in 2024 is not great at giving. In fact, this is wild. Okay, in the Great Depression, Christians gave, or in the Great Depression, uh, Christians gave 3.3% per capita. Today, it's even less than that. We give less than we did in the Great, uh, the Great Depression. We give at 2.5% today. So it's not an opinion. It's a fact. The American church isn't great at giving. And the point of me reading these numbers to you isn't to dose a healthy sense of guilt on all of our heads. It's more like to pose a helpful question. What would happen if the church gave? And what would happen if, let's say, the church committed to giving 10%? There was an article published by a magazine, and I just want to go over it because it was so mind-blowing to me. They said a few of the things that would happen if people who are committed Christians, that means committed Christians, they're attending church regularly, if just that group began to tithe and began to give a 10%. If that happened, there would be an additional, this is mind-blowing to me, $165 billion for churches to use. Yes, I said billion. $165 billion for churches to use and distribute. Let's just say, like, the global impact of that could be phenomenal. So this article broke down kind of the different things that we could do with that $165 billion. 25 could be used to relieve global hunger, starvation, and death from preventable diseases in five years. We could do that in five years. With 12 more billion, we could eliminate illiteracy in five years. And did you know that where reading rates go up, crime goes down? So in five years, we could do that. With 15 billion, we could solve the entire world's water and sanitation issues, specifically at places in the world where one billion people live on less than a dollar a day. With another billion, we could financially support all current overseas missions work. That means every missions project that's currently going on, we could fund it and make it happen with a billion dollars. 
And then, if you've been keeping track because you're just a math major or something, I don't know. I don't know. I don't have a mind for that. But 110 billion ish left over could be used for additional ministry expansion. Think about that. We just finished singing here as in heaven. That's what heaven looks like. That's part of what it's going to look like for his kingdom to come to earth. And it's a crazy thought that that's possible within our lifetime. It's possible within your lifetime, within my lifetime, and not because of a government program or a socialist regime, just a generous, giving church. Still, we hear numbers like 165 billion and we're thinking, okay, I don't have that and I can't control what others give. And with numbers like that, it can feel like what you give doesn't matter. It's the same thing people say about voting. My vote doesn't matter. But you put a whole bunch of votes together and you know what it does? It matters. As Christians, you and I will one day stand before God. And we're going to have to give an account for how we used our resources. Sometimes we don't think about that. We think, okay, I'm a Christian, so I'm not going to be judged by God. You will. Your Bible says this. It's not just unbelievers who are going to stand for judgment. Because we're supposed to be building his kingdom. And so God is going to look at each one of us, and he's going to evaluate what we did with what we have. So as Christians, as one who will stand before God, we should take the time to consider, okay, what is God asking of me? What does God want from me? I don't have $165 billion, but I probably have something. So today we're going to look at what the Bible says about giving. And we're, the Bible has so much to say about giving, it would be like a fire hydrant. But I know you guys probably just want the um, cliff notes, so that's what we'll do today. But we're going to start in Genesis, okay? So if you have your Bibles, open it up. Genesis is a crowd favorite because it's right at the beginning and you know where to find it. Or open it up on your Bible app or we'll put it on the screen. So we're going to look at a little bit what the Bible has to say about giving. And this is one of the first instances that there's giving. It happens before, you guys know, Cain and Abel bring an offering to the Lord. So there are stories that happen before. But we're going to go to Genesis 14 to Father Abraham, the guy we sang songs about as a kid if you grew up in the church. Now again, we're dropping in in the middle of a story, so I'll try to give you a little context. Abraham, this is, the text is going to say Abram. It was before God gave him a new name. So Abram, Abraham, was a very wealthy man, okay? He was so wealthy that his wealth spilled over to his other family members, including to his nephew Lot. And this is in the middle of a story where you see Abraham and Lot have to actually spread out because they have too many horses and cows and, and little fainting sheep or whatever. Fainting goats? Is it fainting goats? Have y'all seen those? Anyway, they had too many of them and they had to spread out and make some room. And at this point in the story, Lot, his nephew, moves toward a city called Sodom. Now, this moving towards the city, Sodom is a pretty wicked city and doesn't have a great ending. And Lot's decision to move towards that city causes a lot of problems in his life, and this is the first one. So Lot moves towards Sodom, and there's surrounding kings in the area who say, you know what, we're going to go and we're going to rob Sodom. We're going to take their women, we're going to take their supplies, we're going to take all their stuff. And on the way out, they actually grabbed Lot's stuff too. Yeah, bad day. So Abraham and his men actually pursued these kings that robbed them, and they actually recovered all the wealth. I know we sing songs, Father Abraham had many sons, yada, yada. But did you know he was actually an incredible military leader? He was. That's what your Bible says. He was actually able to defeat these kings, took back all the resources. And following this victory, Abraham takes 10% of the plunder that he got back, and he gifts it, dedicates it, to the high priest at the time, Melchizedek. The passage we're about to read is Genesis 14, 21, and this is what the king of Sodom said to Abraham. The king of Sodom said to Abraham, 
Give me back the people, but keep all the plunder for yourself. He was just so grateful. That's me ad-libbing. But Abraham told the king of Sodom, I swear to God, the high God, creator of heaven and earth, this solemn oath, that I'll take nothing from you, not so much as a thread or a shoestring. I'm not going to have you go around saying I made Abraham rich. Abraham is doing two things in this passage. The first is he was giving out of his abundance. Abraham already had so much. God had really blessed him. He didn't need the plunder from the kings or didn't need the plunder from his own nephew Lot, which he had given him in the first place. So Abraham was giving out of his abundance. He was giving a tenth to God as a thank you because God had given him victory in the battle. He's doing something else. Abraham's making clear, it's God who brought me here. It's God who blessed me. It's God who filled my cup to overflow. It's God who brought me into abundance. And nobody's going to get the victory for that but God. Some of you are there. Some of you are in a place of great blessing and abundance. And God brought you there so that you can be a blessing to others. Don't ever miss a chance to give God the glory for what you have. It can be here today and gone tomorrow. We're all going to stand, like I said, and give an account for what God has given us. So if you have great resources, pray. Ask God to give you the wisdom about what you should do for your resources and how to be a part of using your resources for bringing him glory. When you steward them well... Your Bible promises that God will trust you with even more. We're going to get to that later. I know some of you are sitting here thinking, that's great, Pastor Amanda. But that doesn't apply to me. Okay? I'm more of a paycheck to paycheck kind of person. I'm more of a adding water to the bottom of a shampoo bottle to make it last a little longer kind of person. I'm barely paying my bills and those creditors are still calling me. If that's where you're at, don't worry. The Bible has a story for that too. Flip a few chapters in your Bible to Genesis 22. This is the story of Jacob. Again, we're dropping into a little story to see somebody give. So in this story, this is Jacob. He's actually the grandson of Abraham. Jacob had a twin named Esau. Jacob and Esau are twins, but Esau was born first, so Esau is supposed to get the family blessing that the firstborn would get. At this point in the story, we're dropping in. Rebecca, which is their mother, helps Jacob trick her husband and Jacob's father to give the blessing to Jacob instead of her older son, Esau. Now, in this situation, you can tell that there's a lot of interesting family dynamics. The mom obviously has a favorite, and the father's so old that he can be tricked into blessing one of his sons and not the other. Basically, what happens is they succeed, they trick Isaac, and then Esau is so upset about this, he says, I'm going to kill my brother. He vows that he's going to kill Jacob, and so Jacob has to run for his life. Jacob has to leave everything, the inheritance he was supposed to get, even any comforts that he would have had as just a child living in that home. Jacob has to run for his life and leave everything behind. He's going to live with some distant relatives and get some shelter there. But God gives him an incredible dream. It was a dream about a ladder that connects heaven to the earth. In this dream, God gives Jacob hope that God is going to fulfill every promise he made to uh, Abraham, Jacob's grandfather, and he's going to do it through Jacob. Amidst experiencing this dream, Jacob makes a vow to God. Let's go to Genesis 28, verse 20. Jacob vowed a vow. If God stands by me and protects me on this journey which I'm setting out, keeps me in food and clothing, and brings me back in one piece to my father's house, this God will be my God. This stone that I've set up as a memorial pillar will mark this as a place where God lives, and everything you give me, I'll return a tenth to you. Notice this. Jacob committed to giving a tenth before he fully trusted God. Jacob said, if God stands by me, if 
God protects me, if God keeps me clothed, if, then this God will be my God. But God, everything you give me, I'm going to give a tenth to you. Jacob's tithe wasn't one of overflow, abundance, and thanksgiving like Abraham's was. Jacob's was a tithe of promise. He was believing God for things he couldn't see yet, provision he didn't have yet. Let's not romanticize this. I know sometimes it's easy for us to do that with the Bible, but Jacob was on the run. This kid was broke as a joke, okay? He was heading to stay with extended family in another city, but he said, Lord, whatever you let come into my hands, 10%, it's going back to you. Ultimately, God would fulfill every promise that he made to Jacob. The promises that God said he would do through Abraham, he did through Jacob. Jacob went on to have 12 sons. These 12 sons became the 12 tribes of Israel. And eventually, because of one son named Joseph, just go read the book of Genesis, all of them moved into Egypt. And life was good in Egypt under a certain pharaoh, but after a while, a new pharaoh came into power, and he enslaved the family of Jacob. He forced them to build his projects. God eventually delivered the family of Jacob from their slavery and into the beautiful land, the promised land that God had first promised Abraham. Once the people had their freedom from Egypt... God, through Moses, showed them how they were to live. He gave them the blueprint, the paradigm, the recipe to be the people of God. He showed them how to live. And the family of Jacob, also known as Israel, were to be a generous people. We're going to do a little overview. I promise I'll keep it quick. Overview of giving under the law. So God gave them a law or a command that they were all to follow. It was no longer spontaneous giving by Abraham, no longer spontaneous giving by Cain and Abel, no longer spontaneous giving under Jacob. But this was going to be the standard for the people of God. They gave three tithes and or taxes. The first one was the temple tax. That kept the lights on. So you may know, uh, you probably do know that one tribe out of the 12 didn't get land like everybody else. They didn't get property like everybody else in houses. They were the Levites. They were to live around the temple. And so what God did was he said to the other tribes, you're responsible for keeping and taking care of this tribe, the Levites. So the Levites would work the temple. They were the ones who led the sacrifices. They were the ones who served the Lord in that capacity. And the other tribes kept the lights on. They kept the Levites fed and their families clothed. They took care of that tribe. The second kind of tithe or tax that God commanded that the people give was for times of celebration. Because in this culture, God said, everybody's going to get to participate in my festivals. Everybody's going to get to worship. Everybody's going to get to vacation. Everybody's going to get this time together. And so they all pulled resources to make sure that it was possible for their children and for families and for servants. The third tithe or tax was to cover the poor. Some of their resources were always pulled to take care of those who had fallen on hard times to take care of the widow, to take care of the orphan. God, through his commands, made provision for that. And it's funny, if you add up everything that the Jews gave, it actually totals about 25% of everything that they had. 25%. 10% is starting to sound pretty good, isn't it? Man. So the question is, what do we do with this? We're Christians, right? We're not under the law. So do we copy and paste the law to today? Are we required to give the same amount of giving as Israel was? To know how to look at the law, we have to look at Jesus. Because Jesus fulfilled the law. Go to Matthew 5. We're going to read in verse 38. Jesus said, I have not come, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. 
I've not come to abolish them, but I've come to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything's accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commandments and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. So what this passage teaches us is that Jesus didn't come to delete what had been said before. He came to show us perfectly what it looks like. Jesus lived out the law perfectly, demonstrating to us what the commandment should have pointed us to. So if the command to tithe is the law, what does its fulfillment in Jesus look like? All we have to do is scoot down a few verses to Matthew 5, 38. Jesus said, you've heard it said, you've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. You see, Jesus here doesn't present us a formula or a percentage, but gives a simple and radical approach to generosity. An approach to generosity that I think if we were being honest makes us a little uncomfortable. Someone tries to take our tunic and we respond by giving them our coat as well. Somebody slaps us on the cheek and we're to give them the other one. This radical generosity is the mark of a Jesus follower. We're going to turn to 2 Corinthians next. <clears throat> and I know we're jumping all over the place, but the Bible paints us a picture, if we're willing to look long enough, of what generosity should look like in our lives. Radical generosity is the mark of a Jesus follower. And in 2 Corinthians 8, which we're going to next, we see the Apostle Paul later, after Jesus has already gone back to heaven, we see Paul paint a picture of what this kind of radical generosity looks like when it takes over a church. 2 Corinthians 8, Paul said, Now I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, what God in his kindness has done through the churches in Macedonia. I'm reading starting in verse 1, if you're following along in your Bible. They're being tested by many troubles, and they're very poor, but they're also filled with abundant joy, which has overflowed in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave not only what they could afford, but far more, and they did it of their own free will. They begged us again and again for the privilege of sharing in the gift for the believers in Jerusalem. They did even more than we had hoped, for their first action was to give themselves to the Lord, and to us, just as God wanted them to. Listen to some of those words. These are not people who have a easy life. They're being tested by many struggles. They're very poor, but they're filled with abundant joy that has overflowed in rich generosity. They gave more than they could afford. They did it of their own free will. They begged for the privilege to give. That's not a problem that we usually have in the American church. Please, please let me give. I want to give so much. Please let me give. They begged for the privilege of sharing in the gift for the believers in Jerusalem. They did more than we had hoped because they had first given themselves to the Lord and then to their community, just as God wanted them to do. This is what Jesus calls his church to. He didn't call us to be house maintainers. He called us to the kind of radical generosity that turns average people into kingdom builders. Jesus is looking to his followers to be the kind of people who build his kingdom instead of their own. 
Jesus didn't call us to pay some kind of tithe bill. He called us to honor him with every resource we have. And we can't come to this from a place of guilt. This kind of giving is a matter of the heart and not the wallet. Hunter said something similar this morning during offering time. He, if God gets our hearts, he'll have our wallet. If God gets our hearts, he'll have our wallet. You see, God has entrusted each of us with time, talents, and resources. And the purpose of God entrusting these things to us is that we would use them to build his kingdom. And the truth is, one day, every one of us will stand before God and we will give an account for how we use those resources. Notice what Abraham said. Did God work some kind of wild miracle where Abraham didn't have to work to go pursue and get all of that back from those evil kings? Abraham did it himself. But who did he give the glory for it? But then we turn around and we work jobs and we think in our pride, I've earned this. I've done this. Instead of having a perspective that everything I have is from his hand. He has given me the job. He has provided the income. He has blessed my business. He's opened the right doors. He's done this. So everything I give back to him. On your own, you may not have much. On my own, I may not have much. I certainly don't have the funds to end world hunger or end illiteracy or to get the gospel to every nation. We may not have much on our own, but that's how the church worked. Jesus set up his church so that what you have combined with what I have, combined with what they have, is everything we need to build his kingdom. We have no idea what we're doing when we withhold our little. So after describing this radically generous A-plus church, Paul goes on to write this. Go with me to 2 Corinthians 9. We're going to go to uh, verse 6. Paul said, remember this. A farmer who plants only a few seeds... We'll get a small crop. One plus one equals two. He says if you plant a few seeds, you're getting a small crop. But the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each decide in your own heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. For God loves a person who gives what? Cheerfully. Cheerfully. And God will generously provide everything you need. Then you will have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. As the scriptures say, they share freely and give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. For God is the one, verse 10, for God is the one who provides the seed for the farmer and the bread to eat. In the same way, he will provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. Yes, you will be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. And when we take your gifts to those who need them, they will thank God. So two things will result from this ministry of giving. The needs of the believers and connection with neighborhood church will be met and they will joyfully express their thanks to God. Maybe I changed neighborhood church from Jerusalem, but <laughs> here as in heaven. As a result of your ministry, they will give glory to God for your generosity to them and all the believers will prove that you're obedient to the good news of Christ. Your giving proves your obedience to the gospel. And they will pray with you, they will pray for you with deep affection because of the overflowing grace God has given you. Thank God for this gift. Too wonderful for words. This is why we say we don't give to neighborhood church, we give through neighborhood church. Because this church is an embassy for heaven. This church and everything we do through Bat Cow, 
through 12 baskets and food donations, through Table Talk Gala in a few weeks, through everything that happens here day in and day out. The purpose here is to build his kingdom and to see his kingdom come. Sometimes we look at the things to be done, end world hunger, end illiteracy. This is the work that Jesus left us to do, to share the gospel and to bring about good in the world. We're not to be people who are just holding on to our seats and waiting for the second coming. God left us work to do, and he equipped us to do it. Don't let the enemy fool you into thinking that God gave you a job he didn't equip you for. We have the resources we need. We're called to build his kingdom, and it takes physical resources just as much as it takes spiritual resources. And God gave us those. I think when we say things like, and it's said with the best of intentions, I've said it a million times, when we say things like, God, increase this offering, we should be saying that from a place of, God, I've given all I can. Make it work. God, I've given all I can. We've given all we can. Make it work. Maybe you can better relate to where Abraham is in life. Maybe Jacob's situation better describes your season. Maybe you're somewhere in between. Maybe you're sitting here thinking, all I have is straw. I, I don't even know how to live a radically generous life. What I have isn't enough. And the Lord is saying, straw is what I use to make my bricks. You have an ingredient. You have resources, whether it's your money, whether it's your time, whether it's your talents, you have resources to build his kingdom. I think sometimes we don't always know where to start, but I know just like Solomon, we can pray and ask God to give us the wisdom to be radically generous and to know how to go about that. Pastor Tori said something last week that stayed with me all week. He said, when you do what's right in his eyes, you can always trust the outcomes. So if he's calling you to give your straw, give your straw. You can trust his outcomes. You and I have to do our part, and we have to leave the results up to him, right? When you stand before God one day, it's just like the parable of the talents. You guys remember there's three individuals in this parable that Jesus tells, and he gives a certain amount of resources to each of them. The first doubles what he had, the second similar, the third doesn't do anything with what God had given him. I don't know about you, but I don't want to stand before God one day and say, I didn't do what, I didn't do anything with what you gave me. You gave me straw that needs to go in bricks so that bricks could build your kingdom, but I hid that away because I didn't think it was important. And what did Paul say? That when we give what we have, God will give us even more. Generosity will overflow in our lives. So the question that I want us all to reflect on today, and I think that we should take some serious consideration and ask ourselves, Am I building his kingdom, or have I been more concerned about building my own? Because when I stand before God one day, I don't want to say, God, I spent my time building my own kingdom. I knew it was temporary, and I know what your word says, but I spent my time building my own kingdom instead of yours. I don't think any of us want to be there. The worship team can come back up. I think now in this time, and again, generosity that comes from the Christian life is never from a place of condemnation, never from a place of you're forced to do this. It's always a response to his grace, and it's always an indication that your heart is set towards heaven. Hunter quoted it this morning, where your heart is, what is it? Where your where your treasure is, your heart will be also. Thank you. 
Where your treasure is, your heart will be also. We're going to stand once again, and we're going to sing. And I want you to hear these words for what they really are. Spirit of God, fall fresh on us. Your kingdom come. Your will be done here as in heaven. That's asking God to move, but God made us his partners. Genesis, if you go all the way to the back, he equipped us, made us to be builders, made us to be builders who make his kingdom come, not our own. God has a job he wants you to do. God has time and gifts and talents and resources that he built into who you are, that he designed, and it meets a need in his kingdom. If you don't know what that is today, ask him. Ask him and let us, let us be people who are more concerned about building his kingdom that our own, than our own and seeing his kingdom come, his will be done in the earth as it is in heaven. <laughs>